Okay, we're gonna look at how to separate mixtures. And the first thing we're really gonna focus on is that for the most part, we're gonna be dealing with physically separating a mixture into its substances, not chemically changing anything. Okay, so for the most part, all these examples we're gonna to come to are gonna be physically separating one substance, one pure substance from another pure substance. So we're talking about separating mixtures here. I will note, okay, um, that you can do what's called electrolysis, and that's going to be separating chemically by electricity. So it's a slightly different thing, all right? This is more and more you take um, a compound, run electricity through it, and then separate it into its elements. So that is not separating a mixture. This would be separating a pure substance, okay? So there's a little bit difference there. I just thought I'd throw that one out there because sometimes people have heard of that one, okay? So for the most part now, we're going to deal with just physically separating one pure substance from another pure substance. That's how you tell something's a mixture. You can physically separate it versus chemically separating it, which would be separating like a compound. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna start with filtration. All right, this is probably the most known one, probably the easiest one. Okay, you are separating according to solubility and size. When we talk about solubility, that means that you're separating it based on whether or not something can dissolve in something else. Okay, one should dissolve and one will not. Mainly, if something is insoluble, that means that it doesn't dissolve. If something is soluble, that means that it does dissolve. We talked about this last chapter when we're doing the lab tasks. There are kind of two parts. You have what's called the filtrate, which is what passes through. And you have the residue. I did not say this one last time. Is the solid that remains. So when you're dealing with filtering, okay, remember you have to take the filter paper, you put the filter paper in the funnel, you run the, usually our decanting kind of while you're, or kind of decanting into the filter paper basically, okay, and then you have the solid that remains, you have the filter that runs through, it's very simple, <clears throat> very, very straightforward, okay. Evaporation and crystallization, all right, now we are not separating um, a solid from a liquid in terms of filtering through something, now you are separating the solid from the liquid by using heat, okay? So again, we're always separating something. Filtering is usually solid from liquid. This one is also solid from liquid, but you're separating a solid from a liquid um, in terms of one that is soluble, and so you're doing it through heat. Remember, it's soluble, so that means this is something that is dissolved in your solution or dissolved in your solvent, okay? Um, it's very straightforward, we've done this before, okay, you did it in the very first lab task lab, okay? You take heat and you evaporate your solvent, leave your, leave your solute behind, okay? And those are your crystals. So like the picture over here on the right, you're dealing with, basically that's what you did in your lab with a um, evaporating dish, you have the solid that's left, and then you have the um, solvent that is evaporated. Kind of the other direction of that is crystallization. So now you're not using necessarily heat to go to get the um, solid to stay behind and the liquid to go away. Now you're dealing more with you're trying to crystallize something out of a solution. So you've got a solution and you're trying to get all the solid back out of the solution by crystallizing it, kind of like rock candy. Okay, so crystallization, you're dealing with something very similar to rock candy. You're going to do this in, a, in your lab, not rock candy in particular, but you're going to um, crystallize something. So how it works, now you're waiting for your water to evaporate. It's kind of a slower version here, you're not heating it. And the slower method here makes it happen a little bit differently, okay? So when you're making, or what you're gonna do kind of in your lab, all right, or when you make rock candy, is you're gonna have some kind of container, all right? You have your solution in here that has extra solute particles in it. Okay, so it's got extra solute particles in here floating around. What you do is you put um, some kind of like, you just have a stick in there, okay? So I have this um, stick or string. A lot of times it's a string as well. We're gonna do a string. So you kind of lay something across the top and we're gonna lay a stick across the top. You have a string that sits down in it, all right? Now as the water evaporates, so you leave the solution sit out overnight, okay? And you have water that evaporates just because water evaporates, right, with the, with the temperature, okay? You leave behind some of these solute particles. You start losing water. Okay, as you lose water, these solute particles in here start to bond with themselves and they start to bond with the string. 
all right? And then you get a little crystallized thing on your string there. In case of rock candy, you tend to get crystallized on like a stick, okay? It's like a sugar that's crystallizing back out. So crystallization is kind of like a longer version of evaporation because you're not using heat or a high heat, okay? You're just waiting for the um, stuff to evaporate kind of slowly. So I'll write that all down what I just said there, okay? So the fact that it has to bond with itself, meaning that it's forming more and more and more of these bonds that are put together, which means that that's the crystal that you're going to see. You have to have lots of bonds that are put together to actually make a crystal that you can actually see. Okay, so evaporation and crystallization, very similar. One just a faster version of the other. All right, decanting. We've done decanting before. All right, you're either separating two, two immiscible liquids. It's a good way to decant. Or you can separate a very chunky solid from a liquid. Okay, it's the simplest way to separate something from something else. Um, suspensions are separated this way. Uh, if you have rocks and water, you can decant off most of the water and then filter the rest of the stuff. Okay. So again, remember decanting is where you lay that um, stirring rod across your beaker or your flask and then it allows the solution or one of the solutions or your liquid, if it's a liquid and a solid, to we're kind of slowly or very easily pour into a separate beaker. Okay, centrifuging is something new. All right, if you're dealing with something centrifuging, that means you're trying to separate a fine particle. All right, remember we're dealing with physical things here, so you're kind of going based on particle size. Decanting is the biggest particles. Um, filtering are kind of medium-sized particles because the filter paper will catch them. Centrifuging you have to do when you have particles that would also go through the filter paper, um, but are still, usually a heterogeneous mixture because you still have them in there. They're just very, very small and very, very hard to separate out or hard to get out of the solution. So here you're separating very fine particles. All right, and how these work, all right? You'll see these a lot um, in medicine, okay? And I do use these as well in AP chemistry, okay? And what you're dealing with is you have these little glass test tubes or glass tubes. Sometimes they're even plastic depending on what kind of centrifuge you have. And what you do is you put them in these little like containers here in this circular thing, okay? And it spins them. So it spins them around, around, around a circle very fast. It, use, it uses centripetal force to kind of force all the heavy particles down to the bottom, the lighter ones towards the top, and it makes it much easier to separate. It's kind of a very fast way to separate, especially for very fine particles that you would not normally get out of with your um, filter paper. And it also makes it very easy then when you get these particles, because usually you'll have like a beaker, or not a beaker, but a test tube left over, and you'll have the solid down here at the bottom, and then you'll have the liquid on the top. What you usually do then is you decant off of this top liquid and have your solid left over. Because even though it's a fine particle, if you get them all in a group, it's very easy then to pour off the extra liquid that you don't want. Okay? And I didn't really say very well until I wrote it down here. They have to be of equal amounts. If they're not equal, then your forces are going to be off. So the amounts that are in each test tube liquid-wise have to be the same. Okay, now we're going to distillation. Okay, distillation is where you're separating something based on its boiling point. Usually you are separating two liquids. All right, it's kind of usually two miscible liquids, things that you can't readily easily just pour apart. I can't decant them. Okay, if, if you would be too immiscible, I have to distill them. Similar idea to um, evaporation with a solid, but this is with two liquids. All right, how this works, all right? A mixture, the mixture itself with the two liquids is heated. All right, so we see this, um, it's called a round bottom flask. It has a round bottom, okay? On the left, it's heated, has a mixture in it, okay? The one with the lower boiling point starts to boil. So as the one the lower boiling point starts to boil, Okay, boil, you get them in little bits of like basically in a, in a gas form. Okay, they travel up here. It's called a distillation flask because that's where you're actually doing your distilling. And then you take and you run cool water in what's called a condenser because if you condense something, okay, that means you're taking your gas and forming a liquid. That's what condensing means. You're going from a gas to a liquid. So you have the gas that's coming in down here. Okay, it travels through here. And this cool water, all right, it says cooling water, your cool water in there cools down this really, really hot 
steam or um, gas, okay, cools it down. And as it travels through this cold water, it cools it down and you end up then with the, um, what's called the, into the receding flask. In this case, it was a salt water, but whatever is left over goes into the receding flask. So whichever one has the lower boiling point, boils, becomes a gas, travels through the condenser, okay, which has cool water in it, okay, and cools, the, cools it down to be a liquid. And the liquid then travels out of the end here and you catch it in a receding flask. So you'd end up with then all of this one type of liquid and then the other higher boiling point liquid in here. So you'd have two liquids, the one you started with, okay, whatever's left over after all the stuff that runs through it, runs through. So, okay, so for example, you could be distilling, say, like food coloring and water. Okay, the one with the lower boiling point will run through, will become a gas and run through. You'll have food coloring in one, water in the other. Okay, and that's distillation. All right, we'll talk about magnetism next. Magnetism is very easy. Okay, you're separating iron mostly from a mixture. You're separating something that is magnetic from a mixture. Okay, it's used a lot of times to recover iron um, from different wastes and scrap yards. So they have big magnets. They're usually separating out the iron. Okay, um, most metals are actually not magnetic. There are actually very few. Okay, um, you have iron, cobalt, and nickel that are magnetic. The rest of the metals are not. Okay. Um, so you can do it with some other ones. There are different types of magnets that you can use. There's neodymium magnets. There's what we call alnico magnets. All right. Um, but for the most part, you're usually separating out iron, but you can also separate out, separate out cobalt and nickel that are also magnetic. But again, remember, most metals are not mag magnetic. All right. The last thing we're going to look at here is what's called chromatography. All right. There are many types of chromatography. You can have gas chromatography. You can have TLC. You can have paper chromatography. You're going to do paper chromatography in your lab. Okay, it's kind of the simplest form. Paper chromatography and chromatography in general just separates things apart. Okay, when you're dealing with gas chromatography, it separates um, different parts in a gas. Okay, if you have um, uh, TLC, which is thin layer or thin liquid chromatography, and then you also have paper chromatography. You're going to do the paper. Okay, chromatography, and what it does is it separates out dyes is what, how we're going to use it. Okay, so you're going to have an ink spot here down here at the bottom. You're going to have a piece of paper, kind of filter paper-esque, okay, and it's going to be hanging in some solution. In this case, it's going to be like a water solution, all right. Over time, what happens then, this water carries this dye up to the paper, and as it carries it up the paper, it separates it out into these different colors that compose the dye, okay? Um, there are two phases for this. You have what's called the stationary phase and what's called the mobile phase. The stationary phase is just what it sounds like. It's the phase that stays still, which in our case is the paper. And you have the mobile phase, which is what's moving up the paper, and that's the liquid, which in this case is water, all right? So chromatography and paper chromatography basically just separate something, uh, a dye, into its separate colors, okay? And it's based on what kind of compounds are in the colors as to how far they move. I'm going to look more at those later on in the year. It has to do with polar and nonpolar compounds, if you remember that from biology. Okay? And they're identified by how far they move. 